book of Acts chapter 20. As always, it's good to see you folks, whether you're here in person or joining us online. Again, these sermons are posted online, um, newlifebarry.org, so feel free to take a peek, check them out, get, share them with a friend, uh, download them if you want, listen while you're in the highways and byways of life. But I want to begin this morning with a text that comes from the book of Acts, Acts 20, And I want to just read a portion of verse 35, not the entire thing. And I'm not going to get into the context of it, but I want to just read what the Apostle Paul says. Acts 20, verse 35, I'm reading from the NIV. It is more blessed to give than to receive. One more time. It is more blessed to give than to receive. We may more commonly translate that to it's better to give than to receive. It's an old adage that the Apostle Paul actually credits to Jesus Christ himself. If you read that entire verse, he refers to the Lord saying or the Lord teaching this. A little bit of a fun fact for you, the nerd in me kind of likes this stuff. There's no record in the four Gospels of Jesus teaching that or saying that word for word, that it's more blessed to give than to receive, which means that it's likely part of the oral body of teaching that Jesus left behind following his ascension, but no one ever chronicled in the Gospels. It should not surprise us, by the way, that there are teachings of Christ not recorded in the Gospels specifically. The authors of the Gospels, all four of them, uh, could not and did not record everything that Jesus said and did. They only captured portions that they wanted to pass on to future generations. I love how the Apostle John, author of the Gospel of John, ends his work. Don't turn there, but John 21 ends with the following. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So what we see here is that the Apostle Paul, again, is crediting Jesus with this teaching that it is more blessed to give than to receive. This teaching indicates that as much as we love to get gifts, how many folks in the sound of my voice love to get gifts? Don't lie, Jesus is watching. Only one person raised their hands. Melissa was guilted into raising her hand. Adorable. As much as we love to receive gifts, there is virtue, and I would add a divine favor associated with giving. I don't have the time this morning to outline or elaborate upon um, all of the ways that it is better to give than to receive, but I will tell you, if you've ever given something selflessly, sacrificially from the heart with all sincerity. There is a joy that comes with that. There's something special about serving and giving and offering something of yourself, whether it be at Christmas time or points beyond. Of course, Christmas is a season of giving. Christmas reminds us that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, are to be a giving people, particularly in light of all that Christ has given for us. And I just put before you the idea, in light of all that Jesus Christ has given for us, how can we not be moved to give? I'm not referring to the simple giving of gifts at Christmas time, though there is a place for that. But I'm speaking more specifically this morning about the giving of ourselves as we follow, again, in the selfless and sacrificial footsteps of the Lord himself, who said the following, for even the Son of Man, speaking of himself, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. When we act and operate as a giving people, in many respects, we look like and sound like and operate like the one that we profess to serve. It's when you give that you behave like a son or a daughter of the king. But what does this kind of giving look like? I want you to begin to wrestle with the thought, but pastor, what do I have to give? And I'm not talking about money this morning, and I'm not talking about gifts like Christmas gifts and beyond. Though Again, those things are wonderful in their place. I want you in your brain to begin to wrestle with, what do I have to give that, that, would, that would hearken in a sense or would, would be in sync with the example that Jesus Christ has set? Great question. I'm glad you asked. And I want to spend about 30 or so minutes with you. We'll break a little bit early today because we began a little bit earlier than normal. I want to spend some time outlining a series of things 
that we all have to give, and if we did give them, again, selflessly and sacrificially, our impact upon the world and our joy in the course of life and living would likely increase and expand. So if you're taking notes, I have about five or six bullet points I do want to get through. My original sermon had like 12 points. I think I even uh, teasingly told Misty, I have like 12 points, and she kind of gave me this look like, don't do it. Just James, three or four. I'm going to give you like six. So I tried to condense this. I left a lot of stuff on the, on the, on the floor, if you will. I had to chuck out. I had to lay, lay off to the side. But the first thing that we have to give, if you are taking notes, if you're not, well, why not? But the first thing we have to give is time. Time. The first thing we have to give is time unto others. Of course, by time, I also mean personal attention. Sitting in the same room as someone playing Facebook, playing on Facebook for an hour is not necessarily an investment of your time into that individual. By time, I am referring to the giving of undivided personal attention. You could also put quality time. I'm not, ri- I'm not ripping deliberately off of the book, The Five Love Languages, but certain parts of this will sound very familiar if you've read that book or if you're aware of the points in it. In our life and living, we give time and attention to so many things. I want you to think back over the course of your past week. What are some of the things that you, that you dedicated time to? Probably the most common answer would be work. 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours. Some of you, Lord bless you, 70 hours plus. You take the work home with you. You invest a significant portion of your time to work. Many of us have homes or places that we live. I bought a home about a year ago. A lot of time goes into things like upkeep and mowing lawns and last night snow blowing for the first time and prepping and shoveling and and all the stuff that we do, we invest time into our homes to prepare them, to, to enjoy them and such. How many folks invested time into putting up a Christmas tree recently? Chopping a tree down, trucking into the woods to pull that. We do artificial, it's like an umbrella. Put it right in the stand, that's fantastic. We've actually learned after about 14 years of life and living as a married couple, I just leave. I'm like, good luck. I carry the thing upstairs and like, just set it up. And you were going to throw me under the bus. I didn't carry it up this year. I saw your face. (laughs) We invest time into our education. Some of you who are in school into our side businesses. Some people, 50 hours at work is enough. You have a side business for 20 or 30 more hours a week. We invest homes or time into our bills, our responsibilities. And if we have time into things like entertainment and hobbies and interests and so much, why not invest some quality time and attention into people? Into people. When I was in Bible school, we were taught that love is spelled. You ready for this? It's deep. Love is spelled T-I-M-E, time. I want you to consider for a moment the life of Jesus Christ. I don't have time to fully unpack this. I'm giving you a bird's eye view of some of these pieces. One of the things about the Lord that amazes me is that everything that he did for the most part in the gospel record, his adult life, his ministry, his sacrifice, his death, his resurrection, all of his teachings, all of the things that he did, he accomplished in a span of about three years years. Can you imagine how grueling of a schedule that man must have maintained to do what he did? Can you imagine what it takes to change the world in just a couple of years? In the amount of time that I've had my Honda Accord lease, Jesus worked on teaching and redeeming the whole of humanity. He was a busy guy. If you were to follow Jesus, you'd be tired a lot as he was and as the apostles were. But one of the things I love about the Lord is he always made time for people. And I want to give you a few bullet points, those who are taking notes. The Lord gave an incredible amount of time into his immediate circle of followers. I love reading the Gospels because very often Jesus will give a teaching to the crowds, to the masses, but then he explains the meaning of that teaching to his immediate followers. He goes a little bit deeper. He invests a little bit more. I want you to think about the evening of the Last Supper. I don't want to turn there again for the sake of time, but if you read through the events of the Last Supper in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and especially John, it's amazing how much of the context of the Last Supper is not Jesus preparing himself for what's to come. 
If I knew I was gonna be crucified in 12 hours, I would be a train wreck. And probably you would as well, if we're honest. But if you look at how much time Jesus spent preparing them, teaching them, encouraging them, comforting them, why? Because they needed it. He was willing in the midst of his busyness to invest into his most immediate followers and closest relationships. Number two, Jesus made time to minister and attend to those who were in the masses. Whether it be teaching, the working of miracles, the one that comes to my mind is the feeding of the 5,000. He's exhausted, he's tired, he has just lost his cousin John the Baptist. He wants to get away to be alone for a while with him and his immediate followers. And when he gets to the place where he can finally be alone, there's thousands of people and they're all like, Jesus, help me. And rather than drop the mic and walk the other way and say, fend for yourselves, he takes the time to serve them, to teach them, to love on them, and to provide for their most basic needs, bread, fish, or a good meal. Sacrificial, to give of himself to that degree. And finally, number three, as far as this point's concerned, the Lord made time for complete strangers who just happened to cross his path at the right moment. If you turn in your own time to John chapter four and you read about Jesus meeting with the woman at the well, there's this lengthy back and forth that Jesus has, at least from an earthly point of view, unexpectedly. He didn't plan for it. He didn't anticipate it. He was at a well. A woman comes over to draw some water, and he begins to invest time into this woman. And that small investment of time led her to a place of faith and trust in him. And it had a ripple effects on the entire town, the entire community, and the entire region. If you think you're busy, try the schedule of Jesus Christ. But even in the midst of his craziness, he made time for people. We can learn a lot from that. I want to challenge you, men and women of God, to make time for your spouse if you're married. Don't make your spouse take a back seat to other priorities. He or she is the priority outside of the Lord. There should be one amen somewhere out there. Don't, don't rely upon the people online who are watching this three years from now. Make time for your spouse. I know you're busy, but don't be so busy making a life for your wife or your husband that you don't live with them. And there's no connection and no intimacy. If you have children, we don't have children yet, prayerfully in the next year with the whole adoption process, invest into your kids. Spend time with them. It might be five minutes here, 10 minutes there. It could be on a car ride while, you, while they're kind of a captive audience. Talk with your kids. Listen to your kids. They have so much to say. They have so many questions. I, I was reading online a few days ago, or a few weeks ago, actually, that the average three-year-old, and I thought of Avery for this, asks four to 500 questions a day. A day. And if you spend any time with a kid that age, you know that that's true. Why is the sky blue? Why is water wet? Why? One day I was here, and one of the kids was following, Pastor, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing X, Y, or Z. Why? in to talk at that level, but it was an investment of time. If you have kids, pour into them. Make time for your church family as well. Look to your left and to your right. These are people that quite likely you're gonna spend eternity with. Don't wait until heaven to get to know them. And that oftentimes means an investment of time beyond a Sunday. Because right now, how much are you really getting to know the person next to you? Not at all for the most part. It takes maybe a Thursday or a once-a-month women's meeting, or a once-a-month men's meeting, or, Lord forbid, you invite them over to your home and you, sh and you break bread and share a meal. Or, or you get roped into, like I do, these random things like putting up a goat fence with a friend. <laughs> and for three hours, you just, you just shoot in the breeze, and you get to know the person, and you experience life with them, and you hear their heart, and you grow. Final point on this one. Be flexible enough in your schedule for the Lord to come in and just wreck it. The Lord brings a person across your path you are not expecting, and they're like, hey, tell me about Jesus. That sounds random, but there are these moments that God brings people across your path, and if you have the wherewithal to just say, okay, Lord, is this one of those moments? He'll say, yes, talk with them, pour into them. Be careful how you walk, the Bible says, according to Ephesians 5. Not as the unwise, but as those who are wise. Making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So if you have a little bit of time, and maybe you're super busy, please give some time to people. That investment will pay off for time and for eternity. Number two, what do we have to give? We can offer meaningful service. Please turn to the book of James, 
chapter 1. I did not pen this book. It is far older than me. It is a profound text from the early days of the church. Book of James, chapter 1. I want to read verse 27. I will give you just another couple of seconds to get there, whether it be your paper Bible or your digital one. Because there's something profound in this text that, that, that stirs us in many respects. James chapter 1. I want to look at verse 27. In just verse 27, though the entire text is fantastic. James 1.27, the author says the following. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, oftentimes in our particular type of Christian experience, Protestantism, or whatever word you want to use, Pentecostalism, we tend to hear the word religion and we recoil as though it's an ugly thing. Because we hear the word religion and we think Pharisee, we think of, of the ancient religious leaders that Jesus dealt with, we think of this dead ritualistic form that isn't characterized by any love or compassion or meaningful connection with God. But according to this text, there is a form of religion that God looks at and sees it as being pure, undefiled, and something that he would declare not only good, but very good. And it's characterized by two things. And I'm going to go in reverse order. Number one, it's a religion characterized by holiness. Keeping oneself pure in this fallen world. How many folks realize that this is a pretty broken and sinful world? And we are called to be different. It's okay, Christian, to live differently. It's okay to say... I'm going to be the type of person that does what the Lord says to the best that I can as I rely upon his strength and power to get me there. Don't worry about being weird. You are, and it's okay. I move on from that point to the second aspect. A religion that the Lord esteems is one where one's faith finds expression in acts of charity, compassion, and love. Now, if you continue to read the book of James, he would go on to say that faith without works, faith without these elements, faith without a holiness and genuine compassion for others is what kind of faith? It is dead. Faith without works is dead. There has to be a place in our Christian experience for meaningful service unto others where we look outside of ourselves. Now, this is important. We are all different people, correct? Different genders, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different skill sets. We're all good at different things. Different spiritual gifts as well. The Apostle Paul, don't turn there, but he makes the comment in 1 Corinthians 12, you, speaking to us, are the body of Christ, and each of you is a part of it. God has placed in the church apostles and prophets and teachers and in, in, in works, miracles, and gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles in, the, in this sense? No. Do all have the gift of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues in, in the church-wide sense? No. But what he's saying is everybody has something to offer. Look around this room for a moment. Look at yourself and consider what you're good at what you're passionate about, what you enjoy doing, because that's probably an indicator of ways that you can meaningfully serve those around you. I could go around this room, and if you've been a part of my life for a while, I could probably say numerous times where you have had impact on me by offering your unique form of service. I think of someone, I'll pick on a few, Bubba. You're an encourager. If you guys know Bubba at all, He's good at just rooting you on and making you feel good like you can do it in the Lord. And he's always there with a verse. Here's Bubba's famous catch line. You ready? There's a verse for that. Yep. And it might often tie into a Looney Tunes or a story or, or some cartoon. But you walk away and you're like, wow, you served me by just offering what you had. Another person, I'm going to call on Franny for a second. You know how many times Franny has saved me from landmines because he has experiences that I don't have? And he just comes along and says, Pastor, watch out for this. Or, Pastor, keep your eye on this and deal. And it's just a form of service. March 2017, I believe it was the third, 
looking back over the course of this past year, was probably the worst day for Misty and me personally. That was the day we finally reached the conclusion that going on with treatments for Trinivacid wasn't going to work. And we basically spent the entire day, and it's going to sound kind of pathetic, just at home in like pajamas and not wanting to see or talk with anybody. And I won't name the person or the couple that it was, but I got a phone call saying, can we meet up? I said, honestly, I don't want to see anybody. I barely want to see me. I get a text randomly from said individuals later on that night, and it says, check your door, which I'm like, I don't want to see anybody. If they're at the door, I'm going to be a train wreck. So I'm like, what do you mean? I go to the door and someone who will go nameless, like army crawled, stealth, it was quiet, and I have good hearing, dropped off a bag of food, couple of meals. That small act of service, and really probably one of the worst days we've ever had as a couple, brought this small little light that got us through. Something as simple as a meal. Maybe cost him a half an hour to go pick it up, it was delicious. Small, meaningful acts of service. They have these incredible impacts. Whatever gift you have, whatever talent you have to offer, whatever form of service you have, I want to give you a verse that you should think of. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength that God provides. In other words, if you're going to serve, if you're going to serve the Lord, do it with everything that you have. Be deliberate about it. Put your heart into it, your soul, and just watch what he can do in and through, not just the big stuff, but the small. And I'll move on from this point by saying this. Every act, every act of service in the life of the follower of Christ is noted, even small things. Jesus put it this way. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who are mine, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. You wash the dishes for your spouse just because you love him or her. The Lord's like, well done. And over the course of our lives, we accrue reward not to sound selfish, but it's there. Reward based upon just years of faithful service. So what do you have to give? You can serve someone. Number three, moving quickly. We can give freely to others of our words. Now, they may be encouraging words. They may be edifying words that build people up. They could be comforting words. They could be words of correction if necessary. There's a place for that. Sometimes the most loving thing to do to someone isn't to coddle them, but to lovingly correct them. There's a place for all of this. I want to give you a series of texts. I'm not going to have you to turn to all of these, but Proverbs 16, 24, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Proverbs 25, 11, a word fitly spoken. It's like apples of gold in a, in a setting of silver. Ephesians 4, again, just write the references down, verse 29. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for building others up, that it may benefit those who listen. And again, Proverbs 18, 21 is probably the most famous verse regarding our words, death and life are in the power of the tongue. It is amazing the power of the tongue, the power of our words, to tear down, to destroy, and to, in many respects, bring death. But it's also amazing its capacity, if properly used and channeled, to bring life to someone. I came across an article in my studies a few weeks back, 64 positive things to say to kids. And I think if, if I'm reading it correctly, it was written more for school teachers or for parents. But it's amazing how many of the things that they, that they encourage us to say to kids, they're just nice things to say in general. So if you ever want to use your words, here are a few things. You are loved. You are valued. I trust you. I know you can do this in the Lord. I'll add that. Good idea. You're strong. Thank you for being a good friend. You're valuable, you're interesting, you're important. I'm happy to see you, I'm proud of you, I'm grateful for you. You ready? I love you. Ever see the movie The Help with Emma Stone? There's a, little, there's a line that we always say to each other, and she'll probably help me with this. It's basically a nanny figure always saying it to a little three-year-old girl to kind of encourage her and edify her and build her up. You is kind, 
you is smart, smart, and you is important. Not great grammar, but just go with it. Those words can be so formative. When I was in Bible school, I've shared the story before. There was a pastor on staff, elderly man. He was moving toward retirement when he was on staff. And he told the story one day of how his mom, when he was a little boy, told him, son, you'll never amount to a hill of beans. Now, I can't imagine the context where a mom would tell her kid that, but that's what he was told. And he said as a 70-something-year-old man, it is amazing how many years that stayed with me, held me back, and I allowed it to because I believed it. What if rather than those words, she says, son, you can do anything you want in the Lord. Follow him and he'll give you the power. Death and life, again, are in the power of the tongue. James, put this, James puts it this way in James 1 verse 26. Those who consider themselves religious, but don't keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. James goes right for the jugular. He is brutal, but he is straightforward. Watch what you say. Be mindful of what you say. So much junk comes out of our mouths. Serve others by giving them some words that will benefit them. Point number four, moving very quickly now. What do we have to give? The fourth thing that we can give, and this should sound somewhat familiar, but I do want to reaffirm it, is our personal story and experiences. Several weeks ago, I brought a message based upon the book of Joshua in the early chapters of that text. I'll summarize briefly. The people of God were commanded to build a, a memorial, if you will, using stones removed from a river that was dried by the Lord supernaturally as they made their way into the promised land. Why did the Lord command the people to take those stones from the riverbed to build a memorial? For the simple point of it served as a mechanism for the elders and for the parents to tell their kids of what they experienced that day. It goes a little something like this. Daddy or mommy, what's that stone structure there? I'm so happy you asked that those stones are from the river that God parted and brought us supernaturally into this land. And it reminds us of God's power and his faithfulness and his love and his mercy. It was a mechanism by which a story based upon personal experience was told. God wanted the parents to tell the experiences to the kids. We talked about that a few weeks back. I want to expand upon that, that the Lord wants us to share of our personal experiences and stories with any audience that we have that will listen and if it's applicable. Maybe you and your experience have a story of God's love. And you come across a person that just feels so unloved and so worthless. And you can say, I remember a time where I felt X, Y, Z, and this is what the Lord did. And that experience establishes a bond with that person that has divine impact. Or perhaps for you, it's a story of God's healing power. You come across a person that's broken physically or broken spiritually or their family is broken. And you can say, I remember a time I was in a place just like this. And let me tell you what the Lord did for me and for my family. Faith comes by hearing the word. So as you tell what the Lord has done in the word and an experience, it has this way of catalyzing faith. Maybe it's a story of God's transforming power. Maybe you were an addict and maybe you were broken or maybe you were on the verge of things were falling apart and God came in and he changed things and he set things right and he established something wonderful and life-giving and good and you come across a person that's just where you were and you can look at them and say, I know how you feel. Let me tell you what the Lord did for me. Telling someone you understand is extremely dangerous when they're in pain, unless you've been where they've been. And then when you talk with them, there's this instant bond that forms. Maybe it's a story of God's discipline. You know, there was a time where I was wayward, and because the Lord loved me, X, Y, or Z took place to bring me back to where I ought to be. And it's something that someone needs to hear in that moment when someone is straying. Maybe it's a story of God's comfort. I look across this room, and there are some people that have some spiritual miles under your belt. You, you've been around. You've been through some stuff. You've faced some crisis. You've weathered some things. By the raising of a, hands, how, or of a hand, how many folks have experienced the supernatural peace and comfort of the Lord that he just showed up and he provided it? You have a story of that. And here's what the Apostle Paul says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received. 
Basically, pay it forward. If God has done something for you, share that story. Let other people know. It is amazing what can take place if you're willing just to be open and vulnerable. And I want to just move on uh, from this point with the following comment before I do. No one likes going through difficult times. I have yet to met the believer who follows the biblical teaching to rejoice in times of trial and testing. No one ever wants to high-five somebody when they lose somebody or they face a difficulty or a challenge. But it's amazing that as time goes on, as you navigate this thing called life in the Lord, you, you refuse to run and you just commit that you're going to follow him regardless of what you feel. It's amazing how some of the most pain-filled and dark moments will often become the very things that unlock future ministry. It's amazing how God redeems things. We talk about that verse that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That means even the junk. You've been through some stuff. You've faced some Goliaths in your time, and you wouldn't want to face them again. But that thing has created within you something that's worth passing on. You've learned compassion. You've learned patience. You can look at someone and say, I know what you're going through. No one likes them, but they're valuable. I think of what Joseph told his brother, brothers and what we learn from the greater application of Scripture. What the enemy means for evil, God uses and means for good. That thing that the enemy thought was going to break you, it's just unlocking a glorious ministry ahead of you. So press on. Number five, and I am moving to a close pretty rapidly here. What else do you have to give? I like this point. Biblical insights and understanding. You have knowledge of the word to give. While I share, turn to the book of Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. I want to look at a story very quickly. And I want to share one or two things as you turn. We all have gaps in our understanding of the Lord and his word. No one has ever cornered the market on all things God. No one I've, I've met fully understands every facet of the Lord and has complete and utter mastery of the entirety of Scripture. We all have gaps. There's stuff that we don't know. One of the best ways to grow in your knowledge of the Word and of the God of the Word is to spend time with other believers in fellowship. And it's amazing how the gaps that we have can often be filled if we'll listen to people in their knowledge and their experiences and beyond. I've been in professional ministry for about 15 years now. As a staff pastor and about nine years now as a, as a lead pastor, whatever, whatever term you want to use, the pastor of a church. I spend a lot of time reading the word, of course, in theological study. I, I wouldn't say I have expertise in the word, but I, I have a good working knowledge, certainly after these many years. But there's not a Sunday school that goes by or a Thursday that goes by that I don't learn something from somebody. Patty Noel will talk about tomato plants. And a little bit of my knowledge of the Lord is expanded. Bubba will have a verse. Tim Lee will say something. Fran will simple and summary something. And I'll walk away built up in my knowledge because someone said something, maybe the smallest nugget that other people overlooked, but it resonates and it speaks and it expands in my knowledge and it fills in gaps that I might have. And that's after 15 years of ministry and some 20 years as a believer. There's still stuff I don't know. And I deliberately put myself in these contexts because I realize there's always more that I can learn. It's a little bit of a plug for some outside small groups beyond the Sunday morning. Acts chapter 8, we see that in just grand fashion. This takes place in the very early days of the early church. And it says, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, he was one of the deacons of the early church. So if you're a deacon, this should be your Sunday afternoon experience. Go south of the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So Philip started out. And on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in the charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit of the Lord told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And he asked him a simple question. Do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch replied, how can I? 
unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up in to sit with him. This is the passage of scripture that the eunuch was reading, and God set this whole thing up. From Isaiah 53, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And I want to stop there. What do we see? We see Philip helping to fill in the gaps of the understanding of another person. We see Philip taking the time to serve someone who had a genuine spiritual need for salvation and who had genuine questions about what he was reading. And Philip was the man that God had put there to help to fill that gap and answer the question. And what we see now is the result, verse 36. Skip down if need be. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's some water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? Verse 38, we see that, they, that, that Philip does baptize this man, and then he's caught away by the power of the Lord. This guy came to Christ because Philip was willing to take the time to serve in such a way where he provided understanding and some insight that helped this man find Christ as Lord and Savior. And what's amazing is according to tradition, not the Bible, but tradition, this man went back to the court of Ethiopia and Christianity began to spread like wildfire in that kingdom. The queen, the officials, the regents, and beyond. And for a long time, Christianity in North Africa had a very powerful stronghold in spiritual influence for about 700 years. But it started where? Here. Because Philip was willing to serve in a very profound way. I'll move on with this point. There's stuff that you know in terms of the Lord, his ways, and his word, that there are people who don't know it. And God will call you at specific times to serve others by giving of that knowledge. Don't hold it back. If you see someone wrestling or struggling, borrow Bubba's line. There's a verse for that. Let me help you to understand what you're wrestling with. And again, who knows what the Lord can do? The salvation of an entire community or an entire family or even just one person. I do close with this in all sincerity. If you're going to give anybody anything, final point, give them Jesus. You and I, if we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, are called to be witnesses. We are not called to represent ourselves. If your Christian experience is all about you, you haven't figured the real thing out yet. It's all about him, and he has called you to represent him and to make him known to anyone and everyone who will listen. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Be that witness. Especially in this Christmas season, there are so many conversations that will come forth in these moments of connection that if we can just give people Jesus, if we can serve them, and if we can give them what the word says about things like eternal life and what Christ has done and why he came, it's amazing what he can do. And for what it's worth as we do close, it could be a total stranger. It could be someone that you see in the highway. It could be a coworker. It may not be your immediate family, though prayerfully it is. Let the Lord use you to reach the world around you and do great and mighty things that we can't even begin to imagine. So what do we have to give beyond finances and beyond Christmas gifts? A bunch. Pick one of them and start. Give of your time, give of your talents and your services, give of your words, give Jesus, give of your knowledge, and let God use you to do great and mighty things. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We have so much to give. And God, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Lord, I pray for myself, I pray for my wife, I pray for my family and my church family and friends that are here. That, Lord, you would use us in any capacity you want to use us to reach and impact and serve and give unto others. We want to be givers, God. 
Help us to faithfully give what you have given. Freely we have received. Help us to freely give. As we go our separate ways, continue to add your favor and your blessing. In the name of Jesus Christ, everyone says amen.